Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service at Northwest Bear United Church. It is Sunday, February the 6th, and uh, we made it to February. And if you are a fan of Groundhog Day, you know that uh, this week, um, one of the groundhogs, uh, the one that matters, didn't see his shadow, so that's good news. So maybe we're all looking forward to, uh, to an early spring. So wherever you're watching from, welcome. We're really glad to have you with us uh, for our service today. Believe it or not, I don't have any celebrations to announce. Now, that being said, I know that there are people out there with birthdays and anniversaries and lots of things going on. So uh, if you are celebrating and you're just being quiet about it, um, enjoy uh, your day, uh, whether it's past or whether it's coming up. But I do have something I'd like to celebrate uh, for a moment uh, this morning. After church today, we are having our annual meeting online. And uh, thank you to everybody who signed up uh, to attend that meeting. And one of the items of business uh, on the agenda is to say goodbye to our outgoing chair. Barb Seawee has been chair of our board for the last four years, and her term of office is about to come to an end at this meeting. So we are going to have a formal recognition of that uh, in the meeting itself, but I know that only a handful of people will be there, but I know that there's lots of people uh, including you know, most of our congregation watching uh, today online. Um, so I would like to take a moment and just say thank you to Barb for her uh, exceptional leadership over the past four years. Um, now I know, although she was chair of the board for two years before COVID, I know she's gonna be remembered as the, the COVID chair. Um, and I wanna thank her for her, her diligence, her hard work and her dedication in helping to lead our church through these extraordinary times. Uh, Barb served this church and congregation extremely well, and we will miss her leadership here very much. So, Barb, on behalf of the congregation at Northwest Barry, thank you for your service uh, to our church. And next week, I'll be pleased to announce uh, the new chair of our board, who will be nominated and elected at this annual meeting. The only other announcement I'd like to share is, of course, about, again about church opening. So nice this week um, to have a few of our, our groups and rentals coming back into the building, and of course the office is open again. Um, but we're still a couple of weeks away from opening for services. So just a reminder that uh, after this week, we hopefully have just one more week of, um, uh, of this kind of service, and then we'll be back to in-person on February the 20th. And uh, next week in Northwest News, I will certainly give you all the details about that opening. So we hope you might plan to join us uh, in person. Um, in the next couple of weeks. Let's begin our service now with our call to worship. God is present to us if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. God speaks in the song of the bird high up on the snow-covered branch. God speaks in the murmur of the river flowing between banks of ice. God speaks in the invitation to someone to come out of the cold and rest a while. The language of God is the language of love. The voice of God is the voice of peace. The presence of God is the presence of life in all of its many forms. So open your eyes and open your ears and find the God who is in all and is all. Our opening hymn this morning is Water Flowing from the Mountains. Hope you, maybe you can sing along at home. Thank you. 
Please join me now in our opening prayer and let us pray. Holy God, in the sacred space and time of worship, carved out for us at the end of a week filled with both possibilities and challenges, we seek your goodness. Help us to receive what you offer to us, peace that the world does not give, love which transforms, hope that encourages us, and compassion to care for one another. In the music and message, may your presence come to life, shine through the notes and the words that we might be empowered to be the people you call us to be, people of courage, of hope, of justice, and of peace. We are in uncertain times, and we always look to our faith to show us the way forward. Open-hearted, open-handed, to meet both blessing and challenge with a resolve and a courageous spirit. Draw near to us as we through worship now draw near to you. Amen. Really uh, thrilled to have the uh, entire Kinsey family, at least I think it's the entire Kinsey family, um, offering our special music uh, this morning. So uh, I know you'll enjoy. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. family. This is uh, when we would normally have our offering, and I just want to, uh, to make note of uh, something that you may have seen at the church if you've been driving by here the last couple of days. We've got a new big sign on our, our front uh, lawn, and uh, we've entered a relationship with the Canadian Blood Services, and they're going to use our front lawn uh, every second month for this year to advertise upcoming uh, blood donor clinics in the neighborhood. 
So it's one way, again, that uh, we are trying to, to be present and, and certainly to work with other organizations uh, in, our, in our community. So uh, check out the sign the next time you're coming by. And as always, I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, your ongoing support uh, of the work of our church in all of its many forms. So I'd like to offer these words of dedication. We give thanks for the offering this week, and we give thanks for the support and care of those who give to the work of our church. May we use these gifts wisely towards creating a place where the gospel is heard and then shared in acts of kindness and justice. Amen. Bible reading today is uh, taken from the Old Testament, and it's taken from one of the, uh, the, the prophets. Uh, it's uh, from the book of Amos. So I uh, invite you to listen to these words. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and push aside the needy at the gate. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amen. During the course of this pandemic, life has continued on, which means that babies have still been born and of course people have passed away. And over the past few months, while the world has been distracted by COVID and, and other things, we've lost some very interesting people in the world. People whose lives were lived on the world stage. People who said things or did things that changed others' minds people who made us think or laugh or showed us something about being better human beings. People who, in the course of living, sent out waves that shifted the landscape around them. So what I want to do for the month of February is a series that I'm calling Leaving a Trail. I want to look at five significant people who have passed away over the last few months whose lives have left a trail for the rest of us to follow. I want to look at some of the wisdom they shared, some of the lessons that they teach, the echo that remains from their life that we can still hear, and then connect it all with some of the, the wisdom of our own faith tradition. So I'm not going to tell you who they are ahead of time, but I am going to give you a little hint and see if you can figure out who I'm going to be talking about each week. So I'm going to put on the screen um, all of them for the next four weeks, the themes or the hints, and see if based on that you can figure out what celebrity I'm talking about. Week one, justice that rolls like water. Week two, give to us laughter. Week three, peace is an inside job. Week four, the song of the second fiddle. Now, if you're listening, you know that uh, I said five people, but there's only four weeks of this month. So the last week, the song of the second fiddle, I'm splitting between two people. Now, if you get Northwest News, you know that I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this. I invited people to send me their answers as to who you think I might be talking about each week. Now, again, these are all people that have died within the year. They're all very well known. So... I didn't bring it with me, but I have a little prize that I want to give out. It's just a little bag of chocolate. And I want to give it to anybody who might be able to guess all five of these people. But I do need to get your answers in before next Sunday. So even if you don't get Northwest News and you're hearing about this for the first time, please uh, feel free to, to email me or call me in and let me know what uh, your answers are. I'm pretty certain no one is going to get all five. But uh, if you do... There'll be a bag of chocolate for you. Now, before anyone calls the United Church of Canada or Revenue Canada, this is not a raffle. It's not a draw. 
I'm not doing anything to contravene our charitable status. It's just a little bag of chocolate. So uh, not worth uh, shutting the church down over. So see what you come up with. Everyone gets a free one today because, of course, you're about to find out uh, who today's celebrity is. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our light. Amen. A few years ago, I was reading about a megachurch in the United States. And to be honest, I'm not sure I can remember which one it was. And even if I did, I probably wouldn't share the, uh, the name. But this church was going through a restructuring. And it asked its congregation, what is the most important thing that a church should do or have? I wonder how you would answer that question. Well, they answered it in this way. At the top of that list was good preaching. They wanted someone in the pulpit who was a good speaker. Second, almost at the same level as that, was an excellent music program. And then it went down from there. Good weekly study groups, children's programming, a good outreach program, social activities, and down, down, and the percentages got less and less as it went down until finally it got to the very bottom. And guess what the last thing on that list was coming in at a whopping 0.5%? A commitment to social justice. Now, before we all jump on this church for getting its priorities wrong, let's be honest for a moment. I'm not sure that church is much different from any church, with some obvious exceptions. I'm not sure how far up that list social justice ever gets. And let me be very clear right off the top. Social justice and charity are two very different things. Charity tries to help people within a system. Social justice tries to change the system. So, for example, giving gifts to the women and children's shelter at Christmas time, that's an act of charity. Changing the laws and systems so that, that protects the health, safety, and financial well-being of vulnerable women, that's an act of social justice. Churches are usually very good at charity, including right here at Northwest. We have an exceptional outreach program here that supports many, many charities in this community. But social justice? I'm not sure that gets too far up the priority list of anyone. What if we here at Northwest made a list of what we most want in our church? My guess is preaching and music would be one and two, as it would be in probably 95% of churches that were asked that question. And then it would go down from there. Where would working for social justice be here? Would it be somewhere in the middle? Or would it be further down? Why do you think that is? I think there are a few reasons why working for social justice is not always a priority in our churches. First of all, it can be very divisive. To work for social justice usually means taking a stand that could often be considered as political. And we all know how divisive politics can be, especially these days. There's definitely a school of thought running through our churches that suggests that religion and politics should be like two people standing side by side in an elevator. They can acknowledge each other and nod at each other's presence, but they should never really try to engage with each other. Secondly, working for social justice is hard work, often with very little return. If we give a $5 bill to someone who's homeless on the corner, you know, we feel good about ourselves. We feel that rush of endorphins. We feel like we're making a difference. But to work to change the system to get that guy off the street, that can take years and years of frustrating work to move the needle only a little bit. Thirdly, there's an intimidation factor. Social justice often requires us to deal with powerful systems and powerful people who may be reluctant to change. It's not for the faint of heart. If we are a person who needs to be liked by everyone, working for social justice may not be our thing. I'll never forget the wise words of Bishop Oscar Romero, who worked in the slums of El Salvador and was ultimately martyred for his work. He once said, when I fed the poor, they called me a saint. When I asked why there was so many poor, they called me a communist. It's hard to put ourselves out there 
when there is power at stake. And so we tend to keep our experience of faith within the confines of our own comfort level. Good preaching, good music, and a community that meets our social and our spiritual needs. And friends, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. We all want that in our churches. We all want that in our communities. And I think during this pandemic, we've all realized again the value of those things. Don't you miss our boisterous coffee here hour here in West Daniel Hall or being able to belt out your favorite hymn? I sure do. Preaching, music, and a social life. These are the lifeblood of any good and successful church. And yet, all that being said, one cannot read scripture without bumping up against the voices of prophets, and sages, and teachers who equate the life of faith with so much more than storytelling and singing and great snacks. But rather, they see faith as an engine driving that which can create a better, fairer, more just world. And they call us to consider the hard work of change. Jesus was, of course, the embodiment of that vision. As he challenged power structures in his day, waded into places where no self-respecting rabbi should ever go, leper colonies and slums, even ditches on the side of the road where the most vulnerable were left and forgotten. How any church purports to have Jesus at its core and ignore the, the side of Jesus that held the hands of the leper is beyond me. But that call to justice started well before Jesus. In fact, just as today we stand on Jesus' shoulders, Jesus stood on shoulders of his own in his day. And those were often the shoulders and the voices of ancient prophets whose job it was to call people back into right relationships with God and with each other. And no one did that better than the prophet Amos. His words that I read today are direct and clear. And at first they almost read like an angry manifesto. He condemns those who have beautiful homes and, and plant fruitful vineyards and have tables laden with food. Those who live lives of luxury and yet at the same time see it as just fine to mistreat the very people who built those homes or planted those vineyards or serve at those tables. And then who in turn gather for religious assemblies and worship God and see no connection with their worship and their lifestyle. He almost shouts at us through scripture. I hate your festivals, he says. I have no time for your religious ceremonies. I don't accept your offerings to God. He condemns the hypocrisy of it all. But then he ends his tirade with what I believe are some of the most important and beautiful words of scripture. I will only be satisfied when justice rolls down like water and righteousness becomes an ever-flowing stream. Amos gives us the clarion call of our faith, a call to righteousness, to human dignity, and to justice. A justice that flows, he said, like living water. You know, if someone ever elects me as moderator of the United Church of Canada, which is about the same chance of a snowball appearing in July, I think I'd like to take that phrase and put it in every single church in the country so that we would see it every single Sunday morning. Let justice flow like water. It's easy to forget that the core of our faith is this call to justice. But thankfully, every so often, just as it did in Jesus' day, history lifts up a prophetic voice that reminds us that our Christian faith is more than preaching and singing and feasting. A modern day version of Amos. A few weeks ago, we lost one of those voices. Let me share a little of his remarkable life. He was born Desmond Tutu on October 7th, 1931 in Klerksdorp, South Africa. He lived with his parents in a black residential neighborhood where his father was the principal of the Methodist primary school. Although baptized Methodist, his family eventually switched to the Anglican church. 
His interest in theology started when he was in high school. And his interest in social justice started when he worked selling oranges at a whites-only golf club. There, he got his first understanding of systemic unfairness. After high school, he married and became a teacher. But that changed in 1953, when the National Party introduced the Bantu Education Act that furthered the apartheid system of racial segregation. Disliking the act, he quit teaching, and he went into the ministry. He moved to England where he studied theology, and while recognizing there was racism there too, he was impressed with their concept of freedom of speech. He would often go down to Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park and share his views with whoever would listen. After spending a short time studying Arabic in Jerusalem, he returned to South Africa. He became the Dean of St. Mary's Cathedral in Johannesburg, the first black person to hold that position. And from there, he began to speak out against apartheid. He first raised eyebrows when he spoke in favor of an international boycott of South Africa. Although determined to bring about the end of apartheid, Tutu was greatly influenced by Gandhi and then later by Martin Luther King Jr. And he was opposed to any kind of violence, believing change should only come about through nonviolent means. He actually put his money where his mouth was in 1981. He was addressing a crowd of 15,000 mourners following the death of a prominent civil rights lawyer. The crowd set upon a suspected government agent. Tutu left the podium, literally threw himself on top of the man who was being beaten to protect him, and then escorted him to his vehicle so he could get away. And then he told the crowd there was to be no violence of any kind. Long story short, in 1984, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work towards social justice. He went on to become the Bishop of Johannesburg, the Archbishop of Cape Town. After Nelson Mandela was released from prison, Mandela and Tutu became the leaders of the movement to dismantle apartheid. Even after that was done in his later years, his commitment to social justice didn't end. He became a proponent of gay rights, as it was called back then. And then when the Anglican Church in the 1990s upheld their policy of marriage as only existing between a man and a woman, Tutu sent a letter to the Archbishop of Canterbury saying that he was ashamed to be an Anglican. He also worked tirelessly to bring about policies to combat the AIDS pandemic in Africa. He was a champion of the Palestinians and the Tibetans, both of whom he believed suffered grave injustice. And most recently, he was a champion of climate protection. In fact, his last official speaking engagement was at a climate summit. He died just a few weeks ago on Boxing Day at the age of 90. His daughter said he was ready. He went to meet his God ready and willing. Desmond Tutu, like any great leader who works for change, was a controversial figure loved by some, despised by some, often told he should stick to leading the church and leave politics alone. He believed until his dying day that for the church to have relevance in the world today, it had to stand firm against the forces of injustice, division, and intolerance. And whenever he saw that happening in the world, whether apartheid in his own country or the mistreatment of Tibetan Buddhists, or the denial of rights of gays and lesbians, he wouldn't stay quiet, but kept returning to the example of Jesus, who also wouldn't stay quiet. In fact, Desmond Tutu once said, I wish I could shut up, but I can't, and I won't. Tutu, although not much above five feet, was a giant in his life, and a giant in this world. I invite you to reflect for a moment on a couple of things that Tutu said that I think apply to our world today. I'll put them on the screen for you. He said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If, it, if an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. He also said this, if you want peace, don't speak to your friends. 
speak to your enemies. And he said this, God is not upset that Gandhi was not a Christian because God is not a Christian. All of God's people and their different faiths help us to realize the immensity of God. For Desmond Tutu, faith was not just a quest to get to heaven. It was very much creating a heaven all around us. And thus it is the tireless pursuit of goodness and justice and righteousness. It is recognizing who the elephant is and who the mouse is, and then aligning with the mouse. Desmond Tutu sadly left this world at a time when I think his voice was so needed. What I'm seeing in the world right now Perhaps what you are seeing in the world right now is an increasingly troubling trend. There is an emboldening of those who hold what I believe are dangerous and divisive voices. Certainly in my lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen a time when fringe group thinking or extremist thinking has come out of the woodwork with an increasing level of confidence, feeling empowered to share their views that are subtly or not so subtly tinged with racism, homophobia, and exploitative rhetoric. Never did I think I would see a Nazi flag or a Confederate flag being held by someone on Parliament Hill, as we did this past week. And while I know that they are not reflective of the majority of people there, this situation gave them a platform in which they felt safe to be present. Unless we think this is a flash in the pan, I don't believe it is. There are forces tearing at the fabric of this world that are disconcerting, to say the least. You know, the illustration I would use for this is a zombie fire. Have you ever heard of a zombie fire? This is actually kind of, kind of interesting. Firefighters who fight wildfires, such as we see out west or down in Australia, say that often after they put a fire out, it often goes underground and it smolders in places that cannot be seen. And then when the favorable conditions arise again, they are reignited and continue to burn. There are zombie fires smoldering beneath the surface of our world today. Toxic, disruptive voices and ideas that have smoldered unseen for a long time and are now being given the legitimacy to rise up. To me, the Freedom Convoy that arrived on Parliament Hill this week was an example of a zombie fire. As we've struggled through this pandemic, smoldering beneath the surface is anger and frustration. We all feel it. All it took was the right spark and up came the flames. But what came with those flames was some very uncertain things, unsettling things. I don't believe we should ever give in to fear. But I believe that those who truly value the inalienable rights of all people, who truly value in things like a free and fair media, and who see dignity for all people not as a privilege but a right, should be concerned with what we are seeing in our country, in the United States, and anywhere in the world where fringe groups are feeling empowered and are seeing space open up for their angry or in their divisive rhetoric. When the elephant starts claiming to be the mouse, there is a problem. I believe that history is being made right now before our eyes. And when history is being made, we all have to decide what side of it we're going to be on. As followers of the one who lived unconditional love and pursued unconditional justice and embodied unconditional compassion to me, the side is pretty clear. It's always been pretty clear. From Amos to Jesus to Desmond Tutu, a trail has been left for us to follow. The churches have to speak up in a strong voice in support of those who have the most to lose when society shifts to the right, the poor, the refugee, the sick, the disabled, the marginalized. Leaders like Desmond Tutu remind us of this, that the work of the church is never over so long as anyone lives 
within an unjust system. But here's what I love about Desmond Tutu. He believes that the work of justice is not just the work of those few elites that have power and influence, but rather it begins with you and me. It's our responsibility. So on that note, let me share with you a couple of other very empowering quotes from Bishop Tutu. Do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. And finally this, probably my favorite quote from this remarkable man. Your ordinary acts of love and hope point to the extraordinary promise that every human life is of inestimable, inestimable value. Sometimes the work of the preacher, however difficult it is, is to point to the darkness. Sometimes the work of the preacher, however difficult it is, is to point out the darkness of human behavior. And sometimes it is the work of the preacher, however difficult it is, to point out the darkness of unjust systems. But always, always, it's the work of the preacher to keep holding up the light. Always, always, it's the work of the faithful to keep holding up the light. I believe that we witnessed dark forces in our nation this past week. Don't be fooled with words like freedom and truth. There's no freedom in anything that provides cover for swastikas and Confederate flags. The zombie fire that flared up on Parliament Hill this week should make us all take note that simmering in this world, including in this nation, are divisive and dangerous ideas. We need not let them scare us, but we need to let them empower us to truly be the church in the world, to be the hands and feet of Christ, to truly be the embodiment of goodness and righteousness and peace that Amos called us to, that Jesus fulfilled, and that people like Desmond Tutu continue to live out. Be the light, because never has it been more important be the light in your community. Be the light on social media. Be the light in your home. Let your ordinary acts of love and hope point to the extraordinary promise that every life has value. Stand strong and speak up. The mouse is counting on you. The mouse is counting on all of us. Amen. I'd like to end uh, with a prayer, and then, of course, we'll sing together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. God, as we've listened today, we've, we've heard the voices of ancient prophets calling us to be in right relationships with you and right relationship with one another. Remind us that the work of our faith requires all of us at times to stand up and speak up, to get our hands dirty, and to continue always with the cause of justice, goodness, and righteousness wherever we may see it. May you give all of us the, the strength and the courage to always be a good voice in our homes, in our community, in our churches, wherever we are called to let the light of our faith shine. We pray for peace in our nation. We know that we are a divided people in so many ways, and yet we all deserve the same things to live in peace, to live good and contented lives. May we all strive to pursue that goal. Continuing in prayer, we think of what we bring to prayer today and who we bring to prayer today. And in this silent moment, we offer them to you. God of justice and hope, hear our prayers. May we go into this week in all that we do, committed to letting our light shine, that justice may flow like water. Hear us now as we continue in prayer with the words of the Lord's Prayer.
Thanks, as always, for joining us for our service today. I hope uh, you have a good week ahead. I'd like to uh, end the service today with the words of benediction. And instead of a traditional benediction, I'd like to share with you uh, something called the Affirmation of Hope. I'm going to put it up on this screen, and uh, I hope you'll read along with me. We affirm our hope that a new day is dawning upon us. We affirm our belief that the love of God, which is greater than all understanding, has the power to unite us, to participate in the creation of a better world. We affirm the hope that turns suffering into a creative process. We affirm the hope that enables us to act. God of hope, help us to turn fear into faith and hope into action. Amen.